Somehow still not crazy expensive if you just get a normal one with mileage. It's manual transmission. It sounds incredible. It looks beautiful. I mean, that's basically the recipe. It's a very exciting weekend for me because normally I, I spend my time you know, dealing in these cars and, and, and buying and selling and putting out fires that comes with uh, operating a, a boutique uh, super vintage supercar dealership. Uh, so to share this time with this group here has been, I mean, a dream come true. Um, I don't think I've laughed this much in a very long time. Uh, and, and I love the input um, from each and every one of you. Uh, so I can't thank you guys enough for being part of this. Um, and to me, it's super important to have these conversations because I think we have today a group of enthusiasts and collectors. Um, and, and whether it's someone that's buying a, an RX-7 or someone that's buying a, a Pagani Huayra, um, that are looking for answers. They're looking for other like-minded individuals and they're looking for a sounding board. And I think we're in such a unique place because I see personally, and, and I, I want everyone's input on this, the world changing um, in a drastic way. Um, and I think we are on the precipice of my opinion, the largest shift in the collector car community um, that the world has ever seen. Um, I always go back to things like video games, events, uh, and, and the usability of cars. Um, and we'll talk about that today. Um, so I, I'm first off, very thankful that you're all here. Um, and can we talk about the concourse club for a second? I mean, I, I have to give one small anecdote. Um, I have a, I have a, a terrible uh, dairy allergy and, uh, most of the time I'm like, you know, very cautious of what I'm eating. And, and Brad Kilgore and your team here uh, prepared an entire menu for me that was completely insane. Uh, and, and just the level of, you know, yesterday in, in the cars, you know, the water bottles with our names, the cold towels. I mean, I felt like a VIP. Um, I think I started to act cocky at one point because it was like, yes, I am uh, dignified. But um, it was, it, it, this is such an incredible facility. And I think to me, the overall feeling um, of this past couple days, uh, and and I've known Aaron now for twenty years, um, and we'll talk about this I think with manufacturers and things like that. But when 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 you put love into something, uh, and and you really come from a place of passion, which I know Aaron uh, ha has done, uh, you build something that's remarkable. Um, and whether it's a a roof CTR um, or whether it's this facility. Uh, you sort of see the the fruits of love and passion, all these different things. And you you definitely see it when they're, you know, I hate to say this, but OEM manufacturers, when there isn't any love, you, you see the product. Um, so thank you again, Aaron. Um, this has been absolutely incredible. And uh, what, a, what a place to host this. No, it's a, it truly is our pleasure. I mean, you said it, passion, right? The entire place was built by people with a passion. Our owner, Neil Gahani, is a real estate developer by trade, but he is a car guy by definition. I mean, I think he lives his life to go from event to event that are all related to cars. And I think he also understands that there's a broad base of car type activations now, and it's constantly growing. And, you know, when I met you, 20 something years ago, I was running a, a different racetrack that was a much more traditional business model. And it had a level of rigidity that was built upon the history. It had evolved to where it was, but nobody had taken it to the next level. So, you know, to bring together people like this who are passionate and professionals and what we did yesterday was a great way to use a racetrack, but certainly not a way that works for the traditional business model racetrack. It doesn't monetize in that way, but that doesn't mean it's any less valid. And I think as we look for more fun experiences with cars, I, you know, we call it a course or a circuit. And the reason we do that very specifically is because we do way more that has nothing to do with racing. And the use of a circuit really goes beyond racing. There are days where you don't turn on the lap timer and that's not what you're here for. So if you're here to have fun and enjoy a car, I mean, that starts the minute you come in the gate. That starts with bringing your family and having a place for them to spend time. And it starts with the culture. And every culture in the world defines itself by its food. Who do you know who doesn't love what their grandmother made for them? Right? So. <laughs> We actually hired uh, Brad Kilgore 
before we had brought in our chief driving instructor. I mean, we right in the very beginning took the food and beverage very seriously and it makes it comfortable and it makes it feel like home and it makes it feel like a place you want to spend time and hang out. And whether you do want to come here and monitor your lap times with my driving instructors and get ready and prepare for a race series, or if you just get lucky enough to get invited to an event where a guy brings out some incredible inventory and lets you drive them all, which thank you for that, it's equally as valid. It doesn't mean that one part is right and one part is yeah. wrong. So, um, you know, the place is a culmination of a lot of people with a lot of passion for what they individually do and then an ability to work together and respect each other from the food and beverage side, getting them the resources they need to the motorsport side, maintaining that we have the safety to my grounds crew, to my marketing team. And I think it shows in everything. I mean, even I look at some of the stuff that my team's producing event wise as well as content wise. I'm impressed by it. I'm passionate. It inspires me. Yes. Um, I love coming to these events. You know, I think I mentioned yesterday I'm a workaholic. And then I really stopped and thought about it. I'm not a workaholic. I'm a playaholic. <laughs> I just get to get paid to play. So, you know, if you have a passion for this, follow it. Living the dream. Live the dream. I never knew where I would end up. I just woke up every day and really wanted to have fun with cars. I love that. I think that so describes, I, I think it describes this group, actually. Perfectly. Yeah. Thank Yesterday you. you could see it. You could just see in everybody's eyes the sheer enjoyment and the respect for every car and getting out of stuff, even stuff you didn't enjoy as much. You still you still cherish the experience. Yes. Awesome. So let's actually, I think, I would love to jump into uh, sort of touching base on if, if everybody can give a little bit of their background. Um, I'm going to pose this, this first question for Ed, Matt, Aloisa, and Zach. Um, I, I would love for you to introduce yourself uh, first. Um, but I think this is like, for me, uh, there's a few moments in in my personal life that impacted me forever um, from an automotive uh, place. One was uh, growing up in the back of a 930 Turbo Cabriolet, 1987 Guards Red on Cashmere. I'll never forget the car. Uh, and and it, it impacted me forever. I, I don't really sell too many Porsches today. Uh, I'm not a Porsche expert. Uh, but if I was, I'd probably sell a lot of them. Um, uh, and then uh, my first ride in 1994, uh, I'll never forget his name. Mr. Marcus had a purple Diablo SE 30. I still know where the car is today. I was sitting in it as a passenger seat and it blew my mind. Um, and I own not that exact car, but a similar car today. And I think I, I built my entire career around that one, uh, test driver, you know, passenger ride. Um, so let's start with Ed. What is the most memorable experiences you've had that have shaped your journey as a collector and enthusiast today? So I'm Ed Bolian from VinWiki, and you know most of what I focus on from a, a career perspective through storytelling on the channel and through what our app does is connecting the stories with the cars. There is what the car is from the manufacturer and what it's become through the way it's recognized in history, but the way that people connect to cars through usage and ownership and adventure is really what, you know, ends up defining the cars, at least to me. And I think that that's what can just really captivate an audience. And, and social media has certainly been that invitation. And I think for a lot of people, generally our age, in their 30s and 40s, we're sort of this DuPont registry, MTV Cribs, Gran Turismo, Top Gear influenced generation. And I think we are the current entrance into the collector car world because most people, as you spend 10 or 20 years getting into a career and figuring out how to earn, save, build credit, you start to be able to explore the idea of owning those cars that you dreamt of. For me, reading the first road and track article about the unveiling of the Murcielago at Nardo, setting the three speed records in one night, there was not, I mean, it was, it was a moon landing uh, for me. I was just, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And how could I possibly become Become more connected to that because I didn't grow up in a car loving family. I didn't grow up in a time when there were nearly as many exotic cars around. And when we think about the number of supercars built this year is more than existed 20 years ago. And so it's, it's a radically different landscape. And I think now we're going to start looking at what is that next generation? Is it the, the people who are influenced by social media, the Instagram generation? Is it the, you know, influenced by different types of celebrities and things like that? And I think that's what this discussion is really all about. Uh, Matt Farah, The Smoking Tire and uh, Road and Track. Um, I, <laughs> this is going to sound weird. Uh, when my, when, 
my uh, my father brought me the, my, uh, an issue of Road and Track magazine when I was like five, and had the DeLorean on the cover. And we all know that these are not very good cars. But to a five year old, you know, to a five year old, there's no difference between a DeLorean and a Countach. I mean, that's that's the same thing. And uh, you know, the 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 DeJaro styling and the stainless steel and all that. I, I don't need to explain what a DeLorean is, but but just that image of that car and 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 subsequently you know back to the future and the cannonball run you know stuff like that taught me that 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 cars could be special uh and that the ones my parents drove weren't um and and, and so uh, <laughs> um until he bought an ls 400 and then i was like oh this is a thing um but uh but it really started with um you know not being being the fat kid when you're growing up you I didn't get to I couldn't run very fast and I wasn't very good at sports but I was really good in a go-kart I was really I was really good at driving and so um it then became the search to drive every possible thing I could find to drive and learning how to drive it you know how to drive it better and how to find the next thing and the next experience so even all throughout as soon as I got a license it was well, what will my friends let me drive? What will their parents let me drive? I mean, most 16-year-olds can't talk their friends' parents into letting them try their Ferrari, but I somehow could and did. And so it was, you know, even throughout high school and whatever, I, I managed to, to grow a reputation of being a person who could be trusted to experience this car and bring it back in one piece, which fortunately is a reputation I continue to enjoy today. Um, and, uh, and so it's always been about gaining experiences and seat time and creating a sort of internal encyclopedia about what every possible car is like to drive and the variety of experiences you could have uh, under the umbrella of something that's called car. Well, I'm Aloisa. And um, tagging on to that complete opposite experience, actually, I grew up in the heart of automotive. And I'm still growing up in the heart of automotive, you could say. Um, like I mentioned yesterday, I grew up in the back of an RCT, which is a 964, a single turbo, body and white. I mean, beautiful, beautiful car. And I would always fall asleep in the back of the car. That's what would calm me when I was little. And my mom would sit in the passenger, my dad would drive, and we'd go on these six, seven, eight hour long drives and it was a family affair, it was a family car. And then we'd proceed to drive to different events, to different collectors. So growing up, I always had understood the not only the engineering aspect and understanding how much passion and excitement a car can bring you, but also the good people that come with that said passion because we'd always end up going to see friends, customers, and I just, getting to grow up in that heart of it or going to Geneva at six years old, witnessing the unveiling of our cars and seeing how the cameras flash and people's eyes lit up. I always understood that it's, it's something that has a future. It is something that I want to be in and not only behind the steering wheel, but also when it comes to the community that it brings. And like you were saying earlier, the Conquerors Club is that exact type of place where you always know, even if you don't know somebody if you meet them here or if you meet them at a certain car event or if you just have a fun conversation about whatever car that may be if it's a 911 love affair if it's a Lamborghini love affair you know you exchange the stories and you have that incredible community and then of course the driving aspect I mean getting to sit on my dad's lap and steering for him until my feet reach the pedals and then getting to drive myself is a whole different whole different realm when it comes to the connection between oneself and the cars. But I think it's always at the end of the day about, you know, sharing that passion and not only being by yourself in the driver's seat, but also having either a fun passenger or a fun group to drive with. Yeah. Love it. That's I, I have to ask, just, just interject with one question. At what point did you realize that your dad was a living legend? I mean, that's like a, like, does that like, is there a light switch moment? I have them all the time still, you know, all the time. It happened. Um, <laughs> we were actually, after one of the Geneva Automotive shows, it must have been, I, there's so many stories, I'm like 12 years old. And um, 
somebody came up to him randomly in the street of Geneva, like we were just trying to get dinner after, like I just associated it with so much work and, you know, he always, I always thought in my head, I was like, wow, many people know him, they always come up and like shake his hand, like want to talk to him, I never understood. Somebody came up to him in the street and said, you know, Mr. Roof, Mr. Roof, I'm your biggest fan. I grew up, you know, reading Rodent Track, I grew up seeing the fascination on the Nürburgring. Can I take a photo of you? Wait, wait, I have a roof shirt in my in my bag. Let me quickly change. So this gentleman takes off his shirt, puts on a roof shirt to have a photo with my father. I was like, wow, that that impact, that that excitement. And it's just so beautiful because I always learned from him. You know, you always take time for that. You always spend those extra five minutes. And he told us the story about how he grew up in a 356. And then again, you bonded. And it's all about, I mean, yeah. That's one of the stories, but it's always, always happens, and it's just, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Uh, I'm Zach Clapman, co-host of The Smoking Tire and very occasional contributor to Road and Track when they <laughs> need someone to do something really stupid or dangerous. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't want to say that, but yeah. Um, for me, it was about the, like, the experience of motion. I, when I was five years old, we lived out in the sticks of Santa Cruz, but our neighbor was a maintenance person at the amusement park. And he had taken one of the old, like, not bumper cars, but it looked like a mini Carmen Ghia. And they used to have them on a track at the boardwalk in like the 50s. And they, they got rid of that ride. So he had one, it was powered by a Briggs and Stratton whatever engine. And he would drive it around this like apple orchard. And he took me for a ride when I was five. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. It felt like I was going, eight million miles an hour, it probably went six. And it was on dirt, it was moving around. And I just remember that was like a transformative experience. I was like, whatever this sensation is of moving and driving, I want more of that. And then my dad would let me shift his Scout or his P1800 when I was a kid from the right seat. Um, and that was really exciting. It was like a way to connect with my dad and operate machinery. And then in high school, I was part of a car club and, and everyone had we we're all into muscle cars, but what was cool is everyone had a different idea of what the ideal car should be. You know, one person's like, my car's got a lot of rake. This person's car actually works. That person's car actually stops. You know, mine did none of those things. Like, but they all sounded fast, but they weren't. And I think that led to later with like the one take stuff, we have fans that let us drive their cars and it's fun to see what the community thinks is the ideal car. Um, and at the same time, I'd read magazines and I was really into the Diablo SV. I, I still remember that cover, like fastest cars available. And it was like blue and orange. And so the exotic stuff wasn't around my community, but I was, of course, interested. But it's always, I think I always come back to what do what does each person want from the automotive community? And what do they think is an ideal car or driving experience? And I think it's so fun that with jobs like this, we get to try a bunch of different flavors and dishes and just I don't know whether it's a company or an individual person in their garage that made some weird thing you get to see like what does one person or one group's brain think is the best way to go down the road love it love it so I think I think this next question I'd, I'd love to start actually with Brett um and and Brett introduce himself um and and I think everybody I'd love everybody to answer this because this sort of defines uh, the overall conversation today, and it can be a, a quick answer. Um, but what do you think? And, and this is a great question for you because you have your ear to the ground with all I mean, almost every new car in so many ways, uh, in hypercars. Um, what do you think defines the next generation of collector? Oof, that's a great, great yet loaded question. <laughs> Really hard to define, but I will say that I feel like we truly are on the pinnacle of watching a transformation between the fight in the last four or five years for EV, the segments of hypercar and supercar and everybody going for these outrageous specs, and for the community itself to change, where like everybody just said, and by the way, I just want to state something. It's incredible to be up here with you guys. You're living legends, all every single one of you. But you know, it's ironic for, for us to be able to witness and watch the car community changed so far past a car. And what I mean by that is that the most successful manufacturers today are cultivating a community. And they're the ones that are putting customers in the cars and creating experiences because there are several different collectors. There's the collector that's specifically after just the monetary long-term blue chip value game. There's the guy that has had historics within him 
within his family, within experience, and the collecting is something that's true to passion for him. That isn't necessarily about the blue chip financial gain. It's just about cultivating or curating a collection that's a family tie. And then there's other individuals that don't necessarily want to collect what everybody else wants, but they just want to focus on what's good for them now. So I think there's a bunch of different collectors, but I'll tell you the one thing that I think will tie everybody together are the manufacturers that create the community around the vehicles they're creating because that community, in my opinion, internally is what holds the values up of all these brands, sort of like a brand like Pagani. It's quite interesting. Um, I mean, Porsche are like the best in the game at cultivating that community and saying, look at how good our stuff was back then, our racing history, blah, blah, blah. Don't you want to buy everything we make right now? Um, I think what's really fascinating is that collecting is always driven by what you were into when you were younger and usually couldn't afford. We talk about this all the time, right? When you're 16, you're reading a magazine, you go, oh man, I want the Lamborghini, but I can't afford it. Or, you know, a different car that might be red, Ed. Um, uh, so what we have now is we have cars with dual clutch transmissions and that's far more common or, you know, eight speed automatics. We all want manual transmission. So I'm very curious if the future collector is going to want like a kid who's 14 now, is he going to want to buy a new Golf R in 20 years? Or is he going to want to go back and get, uh, an, you know, like a Porsche from the 90s or 80s or something? So I don't really know. And I'm really just interested to see what happens with that. Is Are we going to see that sea change? and the taste change as the generations go forward. I'll chime in one thing there. Um, it's been shocking for us in our industry. When we first started about almost 10 years ago, it'll be 10 years in December, um, our, our average age of client originally was probably around 61 to 62. That five years ago dropped down drastically to about 42. And today I would say our average age of client, our average ticket price is around a million dollars our average age of client is in their 30s. And I am more and more shocked to see younger people saying, younger than myself, um, saying, yeah, I want a manual transmission car. I'm going to go back to this. Um, and it's shocking to me to see such a young shift um, where even if you think, I mean, a a, a 30 year old or a 35 year old today, a lot of these cars, they might not have even been born um, when these cars came out, but there is that attraction. And w I, I'd love to bring it up later. Um, but I think it's, I, I, I want to talk about video game generation, but we'll get into that. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, but amazing, amazing ins insight. I mean, like you said, I also have the same approach that I like to separate the collectors because you have the storytellers and the history junkies, you could say, you know, the ones that know every little detail of every little car, not because of the car itself, but because I don't know who touched that, who signed this. I mean, you have that approach and they would never put a car on track. They would never take it out for a drive. It looks beautiful. It's a museum piece. And they just get the excitement about owning that and about having that asset as a value for the future. But I also see more and more, you know, car people. And then you have these sec separate um, collector that just had that as a grail, finally has the finances to buy it and is gonna put as many miles on it as they can and not care about it and say, I'm gonna put the miles on and otherwise the collector after me will which um, two different two different niches. And I think the future is getting younger. And when it comes to car collecting, we are all fascinated by the story, whether that be your personal story saying like, OK, I read about this car and rode on track or my dad told me about it or my older brother or somebody in the past telling you about it. Or if it, if it's something in the arts, I find that far more interesting, like, you know, people that you like especially the cars that you were talking about that weren't even there or in existence when now your customers were born they have their references through the arts through design through the, a different approach of passion like the movies and of course video game culture and they just enjoy having something beautiful and that they can still feel and i think that the future in collectability is going more analog because it's more reliable it's easier to fix and we were talking about that yesterday during dinner about how many complications that are so avoidable can happen through so many electronics and i think when it comes to the usability and longevity of these cars the more you know buttons you have the more probable these won't work in 30 years 
and and I think that that's why we have this analog charm and approach currently in in collectors. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of things I see. One is you know everyone on this panel, with the exception of um, Aloisa, who's a little younger than us sort of is, a, is about the same age and, and grew up reading the same type of magazines, Road and Track, which is why I work there specifically. It's not because they pay the most, I assure you. And, uh, and, and, and so we are influenced with the cars that that magazine and those outlets featured, and we want to know how they drive and we want to know how they like to own. What you alluded to a second ago, and I think what is different is people that are now in their early 30s are influenced by cars they drive in video games. And so they have some sense of comparison dynamically of, well, this one will do this and this one will do this. And while it's not exactly the same of driving the real thing, it, they at least, you know, they, they have, they, they're not reading that chart in the back of the magazine that says, well, the McLaren F1 did zero to 60 in this. And the, they're going, well, I can go around the Nürburgring in the, the, the roof in this, and I can do it in the 458 in this. And, and so they have a, an actual sense of driving dynamics. I remember the, when I tried, uh, the first time I drove an actual R34 Skyline in real life, and I went, holy shit, Gran Turismo wasn't kidding. This really is the cheater car. Like this car really does all those. Like I thought it was bullshit in the video game. Like because we would be like, no skylines, but like, no, yeah, it's actually that good. And so, so we have a, a generation of collectors that is actually more familiar with the dynamics of a vehicle based on what they've experienced in a video game, which is very interesting. You then have people our age that can afford, that are that are seeking new exotic car experiences with manual transmissions. And so as the manual transmission goes away in the mass market, but people at the high end can afford to buy these very exclusive cars that have manual transmissions, one can hope, it probably won't, but one can hope that that will trickle back down to other manufacturers that may decide to reintroduce manual transmissions. And if not, um, high-end cars with manual transmissions will will remain incredibly desirable. Um, and uh, and then the other thing is, as I was talking about Ed in the car on the way over here, is that even younger people who grew up post-manual transmission, th the, the desire for manual transmissions may actually start to die off as people below their 30s uh, become uh, able to afford collectible vehicles. They may no longer care. Um, and the last thing is the, the rise of brand name Japanese tuner vehicles. I think the, the Europeans were there first, whether it's Roof or Brabus or a, the pre-merger AMG stuff. You know, those became incredibly valuable. Now, because of Gran Turismo, because of best motoring, we have brands like Mines and Top Secret and Garage Saurus and stuff that, you know, 15 years ago were very, very niche are now enormously collectible um, uh, based on the, the reputation of the shops that, that built them. Um, stock is not necessarily as important with that entire genre of cars. Um, so a lot going on there, a lot of words, sorry, but uh, a lot of thoughts. Great thoughts. Y you mentioned your allergies and that the Concord Club could accommodate for them, and that's absolutely true. But my greatest allergy is automotive depreciation. And <laughs> I figured out early on that with good enough credit, I can own any car as long as it doesn't go down in value. And I always described that both in my personal taste and in selling cars at a Lamborghini Atlanta, that if you look like you won the lottery 10 years ago, economically, it's probably going to work out pretty well. And so I've been saying that for a decade now. So maybe it's now if you look like you won the lottery 20 years ago, that would also work. But I think that when we think about the next generation of collector cars, it's going to look like what it looks like to win the lottery today. And we talked about selling cars to lottery winners last night at dinner because it happens and what they're ordering. And I think, you know, we grew up where you couldn't find Ferraris and Lamborghinis on every street corner. 
we're in Miami now, and you can't trip into the street without being run over by one. And so I, I think that when we think about what these guys are buying, if they have limitless resources from wherever that comes from today, it is hypercars, and it is these unobtainium, ultra-low production, crazy customized cars from Koenigsegg, Pagani, Bugatti, and the so the rarer stuff from Lamborghini, Chenarios, Beninos, things like that. And so I do believe that that's what we're going to see as the halo cars of the next generation of car collectors. But it's also very critical to understand that there being a next generation of preference never disqualifies the current generation's continued involvement in the cars that they already love. You know, we thought that the you know muscle car era might have been over. And then we watched Scottsdale this year. And they, because the, all the... 400 they, grand for a Chevelle. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, a Resto Mod C2 Corvette does a million dollars. And that is because there was another entrance into the market of retirement of the baby boomer generation that they were now back in. And so there absolutely is a next generation. There always will be a next generation. But that doesn't mean that we have to abandon the cars that we already love because you're always going to be at your best in buying and driving and collecting when you're just expressing the greatest passion you have for that specific car and that specific drive? I think it's a great question. And when you asked the question, I had a whole series of thoughts. But I think one of the things I've enjoyed most about this weekend in this panel is that everybody brings such unique perspective and maybe perspectives outside what you hear every day that it makes you think and maybe zoom out to more of a 30,000 foot view to get some perspective. I think mine is a little bit unique in that in my position as a president of a motorsport country club, it is not uncommon that um, a, a member or potential member will exit a company, have an event in their life, move to Miami, have a retirement, have something, come here and begin the collection. So I get to watch a lot of people go through this process. So I see some archetypes and I see some things that are common and I think some of them are repeatable and some of them can be quite unique. I think the unique ones are a little bit of outliers, but I think a couple points that I want to hit on that kind of key on what you guys said. First of all, Matt, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the fact that two or three times you've said we're all in the same age group. <laughs> Thank you for that. In truth, I think I'm a tick older than you guys. I'm in my early 50s. It's 10 years, but it's an important 10 years. Something that Aloisa said, which is people want, and I think most collectors in their collection want that grail car, but there was a big difference in that 10-year age group. My grail cars were not cars that you could really always reliably drive. Okay, maybe that's why I queued to Porsches, because Porsches you could take somewhere and get home. But it wasn't, you know, Ferraris and Lamborghinis and Lotuses were not very reliable cars then. Also in that 10 year gap, I think I was just a little ahead of the video game era. When the video game era came out, I was already old enough to be chasing girls, which was far more entertaining than video games. So we didn't have that same experience and the video games that we played, no, the video games that we played probably didn't have that degree of realism. You know, they weren't. Atari they, sucks. I'm going to go on a date. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much that. Yeah. Boobs in video games no, no, no. I mean, earliest car games we played were Spy Hunter. That was basically a Pong? couple of blips on a screen. Sex? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so now I think that's an important difference. I think the chasing of those grail cars yeah. is a very age related thing. I think societally across all age groups, we want experiences now. We don't just want a car that we park and look at, we want to drive stuff. So if that grail car is of an era where you think you could actually drive it and enjoy it and it's comfortable, I think that becomes more of a center of your collection than, than maybe you want that one grail car that you park and you drive every weekend, but really you want to have some other stuff in the quiver that you can actually start up and use. So I think that's an important thing. Another thing I see is, and I notice a trend about and it's a unique one, but what businesses are people in and how does that drive how they think and what they buy? You know, I've what noticed they that... they on their taxes? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, no. I had an interesting comment with a guy who did quite well in the tech business. Uh, he was in the fintech business and developed software and sold his company and exited it. And he did buy that one grail car and then he started looking for allocations. And he always wanted what's next and what's new. And when I said to him, why, why don't you get, you know, this car's available, he said, I gotta get an allocation for this one. I want that one. And the comment was, you know, I always look forward. I wanna know what's next, what's new, what's coming on the horizon. In my whole career, we were looking forward in tech. 
We weren't looking back historically, we were looking forward. So I think you get a lot of, and you know, I think also the tech industry is much more embracing of successful young people than some other industries are, right? It's not uncommon to walk into a boardroom in your 20s or 30s and be successful in tech where maybe real estate or some other businesses you weren't. So I think that facilitates the growth of that segment. And you see some momentum growing there with younger collectors and younger collectors whose, again, their grail cars are, you know, stuff that I was driving in high school and college, right? But that's their grail car. And then what they want is the next allocation, the newest thing. Those, I'm sure, are your customers quite often, right? They come to you, they get that grail car yes. too, yes. and then they're looking to you, what's next? What's the latest, greatest, and what's, and what's coming there? So I think it's interesting questions. So, love it. Love it. All right. So uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, I want to jump into uh, really now the cars. And I think you you touched on this perfectly. What's the grail car? Um, and this question, I, I'm, you know, I'll answer first because uh, I have a very strong opinion about this. Um, I, I've, I've built a business around my opinions around this. Um, but and, and everybody could think about this now. Um, I, I'd love to pose this question specifically for Ed, Matt. And Zach, um, whether it be make, model, or feature, what do you think will be the next big trend in car collecting? Um, and for me, you you touched on Grail Car, and and for me, it's you know Lamborghini Diablo GT um, never came to the U.S. Uh, it was Road and Track magazine that had a small feature about it, um, and for me, it was a Grail because it was this fascinating car, maybe similar to the Skyline for many people that never came to the U.S. 80 in the world. Um, I'm a massive Diablo fan. And as you guys experienced the Diablo GTR uh, yesterday, it's a visceral experience like nothing else um, to me um, and maybe to, to some of you. Um, so a massive fan. Um, I think also for my generation, at least the Bugatti Veyron. Um, we're talking about a car that I think changed this hypercar. It was the first hypercar in many ways. Um, so I look at that as an important car. Um, and, and I, I am struggling on a, a third one, uh, because I would say that in my industry, at least I can always sell an F40. I can always sell a career GT and there's always a buyer. And yes, they made a lot. There's 1200 to 1300, uh, which you think is actually, it's a lot of cars. Um, but there's always a buyer. And I think that's, it, it's just a, it's, it's such an, they're both icons. They're both usable. I think it's an important part of the next generation. People do want usable cars. Um, and then I have to throw in one that I was not a fan of until recently. Um, we had never owned one was a Lexus LFA. And, uh, we, we took it on trade. Um, the second we, we made an Instagram post and I was shocked at how many people called us. Um, I could sell three LFAs today uh, with the amount of interest. And, and I was actually very impressed with the car. So, so those, are, those are my thoughts. I'd, I'd love to start with, with Ed. You know, again, to me, it comes back to what are those cars, 10 to 15 years old, that the people who grew up loving them are probably entering into the ability to explore the market. And to me... I vote with my checkbook and my passion on it, and it is Mercy Veyron Spiker. I think those cars fit that description perfectly. They have the opportunity for... Something coincidental about your choices. I don't know <laughs> what it is, but there's something about your predictions for value in the future that it just seems... I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. I, I, it's it's uncanny. Spiker is right? the outlier in that one. Those well, roll. they're so much fun. I... Awesome. Uh, they're they're extremely they're pleasant to drive. They're quite maintainable, and they have so many characteristics that you'd find in a Pagani or something like that today. Mm -hmm. And I think that they have so many interesting popular culture tie-ins. And I, to me, those all fit the description perfectly. Um, I have a pretty it's it's my 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 uh, formula for predictions is you, is pretty straightforward. Uh, if it looks good and it sounds good. It doesn't matter how well or poorly it sold when it knew, when it was new. It, it actually doesn't matter how it drives, um, and it doesn't matter if it's actually a complete piece of junk. And so, uh, to that end, um, I think Alfa Romeo Four Cs will be very collectible. They're very pretty. They're trash. I mean, they're awful cars, but they're great looking, and they didn't sell a lot of them. And um, you know, the 33 Stradale didn't drive so good either, but but that doesn't really matter. Um, 
but yeah, you've you've got your your uh, your your fifteen to twenty years up the road. I was in high school, and now I'm knocking on the door of forty and can afford it. And so, I think we're still going to see the R34 Skyline has a ton of room left in it. Um, there are so many of them, but there are so few really, really good ones. Um, great Supras, you know, great stock RX-7 turbos. I mean, anything anything from that late 90s, early 2000s Japanese era where the cars are not just known for tunability, but also for being overbuilt and very robust and, and usable and where the parts supply is very plentiful, but where a lot of them have been modified or crashed or they got cheap enough where they've got, you know, a zillion miles on them. Um, and again, people who, who grew up playing Gran Turismo and Forza and modifying those cars, tuning them in the game, um, or watching Fast and the Furious and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, either either it, it's stuff that didn't sell well, that, that looks good and sounds good. LFA is a, is a great example. I actually was on the LFA press launch, so I knew. I, I went on the press launch of that car, and I was like, oh, well, this is something. This is really a thing. Yeah, those are great. Um, and if you could find the press car, that would be the one. It had 60,000 miles on it. There was a black and a yellow. The the black one had 60,000 miles on it, and that would be the one to have. It was 100% the media car. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, tuner era stuff for sure, yeah. Um, I, I completely agree. If it's good looking and it sounds nice, especially as we have more and more force induction cars that don't sound that good. That was one of the big lessons from yesterday, driving like four, five, eight and stuff. You go, Oh, this is how much turbos have muted everything. So I think a more modern car, LC 500, it looks like the concept car. Basically it sounds amazing. If you put pipes on it, it's comfortable. I think that would kind of go the way of, you know, nineties SLs or something like that. You go, okay, this, and I think that's a classic living today. I know it's like three years old, but in 15 years, I think it will be. Alpha 8C, I've been a huge fan of that since they came out. I think it's one of the prettiest things ever made. It sounds incredible. Probably, I haven't driven one yet. I haven't, I've heard they're not great. They're terrible. Right? They're terrible. <laughs> but, you know, after a certain amount of time, no one cares because you go, yeah, but look at it and listen to it. Look at it. Holy shit, look at it. Uh, and Olin's can fix that. Olin's can they fix can. a lot of that. But in that vein, in a 550 Marinello, mm. so, somehow still not crazy expensive if you just get a normal one with mileage. It's manual transmission. It sounds incredible. It looks beautiful. I mean, that's basically the recipe. And I, I don't want, you know, I think the Japanese stuff will continue to run. And I think there's a lot of cars that will come from there that will surprise people. But I think uh, those will be my three. Love it. Love it. Um, all right. Now, this this next question, I actually I want to start by uh, directing at Aloisa. I'm going to change. I'm going to modify the question slightly. Uh, but I think it's I think it's important. I think the one takeaway we all had was Roof as a brand is sort of this interesting, it's a new car manufacturer, but it really embodies this analog spirit. Um, this question, I'll, I'll first read it how, how we've written it. How do you predict the market for vintage supercars will change over the next decade? I'm going to ask you, how do you predict the future of roof and the future of new manufacturers will change over the next decade? I had to think about that for a second. Well, I think in general, and what a key takeaway for all of us has been is we're all, or at least in this small community that we're here right now, we're all seeking for that visceral driving experience. And especially in a time, and I think I tapped into this a little bit earlier, especially in a time where everything is becoming more digitalized, and I'm also gonna use the word numb, I mean, when it comes to the to the sound of the car, when it comes to all of this, what we in the early 2000s and 2010 defined as luxury has becoming now superfluous for us. And I think that in the future of automotive and like what you were saying is finally trickling down, we're going back to to actually driving the car, not letting the dr car drive you. I mean, when it comes to stick shift, when it comes to all of these you know, going back into the classics, I think that's a big, big future. And I also hope and I'm a big believer in the future of synthetic fuels. 
And I think that that will also be a key element in future collecting. You know, can a car still run? I mean, we have all of these, you know, none of us really want to talk about it, but there is a lot of politics around around the future of mobility. And I think that when it comes to um, bespoke um, automotive creations, when it comes to luxury cars, I think that's a specific market that will be tapped into, is how can we keep it visceral? How can we keep it alive and go back into, you know, the car love affair and and driving and having the drivability of these cars. So I think that there's going to be an interesting shift and split when it comes to manufacturers. I'm, of course, speaking of only small manufacturers, not of the bigger OEMs. But I think it's going to be very interesting. Love it. Um, Ed, how, how, that, the, my question now, basically the same question. How do you predict the market for vintage supercars will change over the next decade? Again, I think the fact that there are new collectors with new preferences doesn't interfere with the fact that there is a set audience for the cars that we've already seen kind of pop in value, right? And so, you know, we were talking about the fact that hammers have potentially had in a decade, a hundred X return in some rare occurrences, but that's a certainly an outlier, but there are a ton of cars that in the last 10 to 15 years have gone up by five X Diablos and Countach is being the, the quintessential example there. And I think that, you know, that doesn't sustain that's not a real thing. And, and no car has actually beaten the stock market for more than a decade uh, in, in history. And so we've seen some momentary uh, op times when that happens. But I think that w values aside, I think that the, the only thing that threatens some of these cars is the long-term running costs. Like you say, the maintainability, can they still run? Can they still be used? And when we look at even like pre-war cars, like a, a blower Bentley we talked about the other day, that you, you know you can use them, and it's awesome to still use them. There's plenty of cars, brass era stuff that you know I don't know. Can you still really take it somewhere? People find ways, but those are the proper martyrs of the hobby, and we need those. But we also, for the sake of collectability and usability, we need cars that can work. And so some of these cars, like Mercy's that have hard-to-get tires and Veyron's that have preposterously expensive tires, some of these things need to be solved well. And I think we're on the way to that, but that's where the advocates for the hobby, like all of us here, have to be a part of the solutions. Yeah. John, let me ask you a question, Ed. To add to that question, how do you feel that today's current situation in the in the car world with electrification and EV, when you start talking about the hypercar and supercar segment, how do you feel that those vehicles that are so plagued with great technology today, but might become obsolete tomorrow, might have lack of support, I would say, by the OEM, by the manufacturer or the battery supplier or tech supplier, how do you feel that that's going to play a huge effect in our world in the future? So I want everybody to pull out the vintage cell phone they're going to use to navigate. I love you for saying that. Today. I love you for saying that. <laughs> I, it, it, it's one of there's plenty of things that we can love about retro and vintage, but holy cow! I mean, what what does a P1 do to get somewhere ten years from now? Koenigsegg's talking about taking the high voltage batteries out of Regeras because they don't work. I mean, you know, there are speed tails that have 20 miles on them because they don't go anywhere. And that is a horrifying reality to face. And I, there's something about somebody who can't afford cars that still depreciate that I see stuff at, uh, you know, the Geneva or wherever they go now that they don't have Geneva anymore. And I'm like, thank goodness I don't love anything they just showed off and I can keep loving the <laughs> stuff that I already like. So Ed and I were talking about this the other day, you know, about, we, you know, cars like, let's just use for an example, a Countach, right? It was it was fairly undesirable for about a decade, uh, you know, from, yeah, let's let's say the, the late 90s to 2007, 8. A Countach was like 100 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand, right? So those cars had, there's a floor, right? There, it's, it's low, but it's a floor, okay? And I'm, it sounds very elitist to say 80 or 100 grand is low, but it's, but for what that was, that's the floor, right? The floor of an electric car is zero. I mean, it's literally zero. And so one of the most surprising things to me about the, the 2013, 2015 era of hypercars, the P1, the LaFerrari, and the 918, is that they still have so much value. Why are LaFerraris 
going for more than MSRP. The batteries are a quarter of a million dollars and they've all needed out of warranty replacements. And you can't get them. Like, why, why is that happening? That doesn't make any sense at all. So we, you know, and, and, and oh, by the way, Ramats can't sell Neveras. Shocking, I tell you, they can't sell Neveras. Um, and, and I love Mate, but they can't. Um, and the high-end buyer doesn't want that. So I, the, what would suck for me as a, as a, as a, a fairly regular person that just happens to be able to order a couple of cars is if it's like EVs for thee, but not for me. Whereas everyone's forced into electrification, unless you've got $5 million for a Pagani and then you get a V12 and a manual gearbox and, and everyone else has to drive, you know, soulless, you know, things that are completely disposable, which is a real sort of, well, well you know, what's funny. I one of the one of our biggest struggles in the last two years um, was not necessarily the demand for the cars that we have, but it was what do I do with the trades of SF 90s and what do I do with the trades of these cars that I don't want? And even when calling wholesalers in that industry or other dealers, they don't want them either. And I, I think today and, and this is this is going to sound slight controversial, I think the only person that's keeping an SF90 is because they have to on their CRM with Ferrari. Allocations are like heroin, bro. Yeah. yeah. You get and g- g- teach a man to teach a man to fish. <laughs> give a man an allocation <laughs> and he will want that drug forever. And 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 that's it's 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 interesting because I I've seen, you know, whether it's a 430 manual, that car is indestructible today. It's change driven. You could put 30,000 miles on it. The maintenance costs are almost nothing. Um you know, I, I can't tell you how many guys have said, oh, OK, I'm going to get rid of my SF90 and get into something like that or get into a 458 Speciale. You know, the end of the era of 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 that generation of cars. Uh, but I'm I'm with all of you guys. It's it's. Uh... The quick answer to your question <laughs> is these cars are about to enter a decade long value winter. They are going to drop precipitously, and it is one of the greatest next-generation collector opportunities because engineers that are learning right now are going to figure out how to delete that stuff, and they're going to give you back a non-hybrid LaFerrari or a non-hybrid 918, and it is going to be an amazing automobile that weighs 500 pounds less and that they have re-engineered or reimagined is the new word we use. And I think a reimagined hybrid hypercar is the perfect car for somebody to start dreaming about because someone has about 2,000 cars right now that they can start working on that for. And the demand for those cars in a more usable condition is incredible. Ready. I think. <laughs> Shout out to Tavares. We need Tavares. <laughs> Battery delete P1. Let's go, baby. Not but, a hero we asked for. But I think I think we also should have a little bit of faith in how people can figure out how to fix things because we're kind of at the beginning of let's say the EV hybrid thing. They've been around for I guess you know nearly 20 years, but people haven't really been opening them up. I think as much. I think we're going to have battery recycling business businesses pop up we're gonna have battery fixing people and you'll have people that could probably figure out how to build a custom pack that would work for a p1 but it's going to be a long long time and it would be expensive so i like your idea where they delete the hybrid system but for people that want the thing to operate the way it was intended to operate i think that will exist yep but the irony of having to delete this thing that was ostensibly to make the car somehow more environmentally friendly in order to keep the car on the road and not be a brick or a junkyard piece of scrap. The irony in that is so crazy. But I mean, imagine, think about the Tiptronic gearboxes. They're all being removed now from like 993s and like well, yeah, people are going back were, to manual. Because they were bad. <laughs> yes. They were very bad. Yeah, yeah, I know. But like back in the time, they thought that they were going to be great in the future and that they're going to be an advantage. And that's actually a very interesting thought. I mean, it is absolutely ironic. Yeah. But uh, what I also find interesting, I mean, we were talking about the separate type of collectors. And we were also talking about those collectors that just enjoy the beauty of the car, which I guess none of us really resonate with because we all are drivers. But there is that niche collector. And I could also totally see that being... Um, 
a sad future, but that you'd have that niche collector that would purchase those cars as objects, as art pieces mm -hmm. and collectibles and keeping them as this is what we thought the future was going to be, but it didn't turn out to be. Kind of like what we look at, like the Ferrari Modulo, you know, or how we look at the Lancia Strato Zero. Those cars never ran, but they're beautiful. And now we say, oh, this is retrofuturism. This is what we thought the future was going to look like. It isn't. And I think that could also be a, a niche. I mean, who can predict the future? <laughs> well, I think I think you nailed on. A, thank you for leading into our next question. But I, I think you nailed on a, a, a great point of these cars as as now pure assets, and and the shift that you know hypercars, vintage supercars, Japanese unique niche cars are assets, and they're, they're true alternative assets today. Um, Ed brought up a, a great point the other day uh, of how Bring a Trailer has has really shown the world that these cars are are liquid. You know, four GTs they're like they sell like a commodity all day long. You know, oh five oh six GT you'll you know there's how many made four thousand made. There's always one on Bring a Trailer for sale, um, and and I think that's also a fear of mine as much as. And this this next question ties perfectly into this, and this is open to the floor. Um, but as much as when I'm buying something for myself, I'm always thinking about value and investment. Obviously, I, I want it to have some investment, but I get terrified when I have someone come to me purely for saying, "What is a good investment that I want to buy this because it's a good investment?" That's terrifying because that's speculation, and and that I don't think. Years ago, I think we saw a lot of speculation. I don't see I don't see it too much of it today. I don't. I think people want usable things. They want community. They want all these different things. Concourse club, all these different, you know, uh, this this video game generation of like, this was my dream car. Um, but this this next question is basically, um, how do you balance passion and investment when making decisions about your collection? And 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 we can also tie in what would you su suggest for the next generation? So, you know, I, I haven't plugged it yet, but I own a car storage business, right? West Side Collector Car Storage in California. And yeah, that's right. <laughs> got to plug it. You got to plug it. It's a smaller plug than Aaron did before. Um, <laughs> but um, so from, from 2021 to the first half of 2023, I saw a huge influx of people who bought cars as investments and let's just say they didn't do both sides of the math and very few people do a a circular mathematical picture of the car as an investment they go well i bought it for fifty thousand dollars and i sold it for fifty four thousand dollars and therefore i made four thousand dollars it's like well uh you spent uh 12 grand uh, storing it, you did a $5,000 service, you paid taxes on it, and then you insured it for three years. So you actually spent $76,000 uh, to sell a car, you know, and, and it's, it's crazy. Well, it's just, it's just, that. it's just crazy that like, I'm sure you guys hear this all the, the car guy math ignores every cost of ownership in between buying and selling, which is so crazy because in any other financial model, They'd look at you like you had three heads if you did that. But because we just want the car for ego reasons or, or driving reasons or staring at it in the garage reasons, we will ignore the total cost of ownership. And so when I personally buy cars, I try to look at a total cost of ownership. And I, I, my friend Rob Ferretti, he goes, look, if, if you, he, he does uh, dollars a mile, you know, or dollars a year. I drove a Ferrari for $2,500 a year or for a dollar and a quarter a mile. And you go, if someone told you that you could drive a Ferrari for a dollar and a quarter a mile, you'd go, well, that's a fantastic value. I have bought fun for a dollar and a quarter a mile. That's what it cost me to play an arcade game. That's great. You know, I don't need to make money if I can, if I go, well, my, the entertainment value of, I, I just sold my Ferrari 328, had it for three years, cost me 75 cents a mile including everything all in that's that's a great value for money 75 cents a mile to drive a vintage ferrari six thousand miles yeah so it's not and but if i go on well i bought it for sixty four thousand and i sold it for 90 
that sounds great. I get to brag about that, but that's not the financial reality. And so collectors need to do a total mathematical picture and be honest with themselves because most cars are not good investments, but they're good uh, ways to have fun. And best case scenario, you don't lose too much money. Look at Dave Ramsey joining the chat. <laughs> You're exactly right. But again, the investment should not displace passionate decisions. Buy the car that you love and you won't regret it regardless of the cost. Maybe it goes up and it gives you the ability to buy the next dream car or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, the the big jumps are going to be shorter time frames. Those are something you can plan. But you know, you say it's not as much of a thing now. That's because you spent the last decade convincing people that XJ220s and EB110s and Countach's and especially carbureted Countach's were cars that they could actually own and use. And so now you've made so many more cars that can be curated and and so it's that you don't have to keep you know on the cutting edge, and so that's that's a big factor. Just to add to what Matt said, before John Tamarian came around, Countach's were a hundred grand, Diablos were a buck fifty, and now he set the market and made it happen. I mean, you really it took happen anyway. it was it was, but I got to tell him what he was able to to do, and no pun intended, curate these collections for these clients. I I, I, I think it, I, I think honestly, it's just about education, uh, and I think it's it's comparing. You know, for me, it was always comparing, looking at Ferrari examples, you know, and seeing an F40, you know, there's 1,300 in the world, and they would trade almost 100% more than a Diablo variant that there might have been 150 of. Didn't make sense. SE30 is just as cool of a car as a Diablo. Um, a Diablo SE30 is just as cool as a car as a Ferrari F40. There's 150 in the world. It's almost, you know, like 10% of the production, yet... At one point, an F40 was $2 million and a Diablo SE30 was 400000 Did not make sense in my eyes. Um, and I also think, I think there was something special about Lamborghini. I mean, looking to the future, I think the brand uh, has built in a massive amount of passionate people that grew up with a poster on their wall or grew up playing a, a Need for Speed video game with a Diablo or something like that. And, and I, I think that, you know, this might be controversial to say, but when you compare Ferrari and Lamborghini today, I think Lamborghini is a more exciting brand in the future of collecting because I, I think Ferraris become stuffy and Ferraris become almost sort of this like, you know, in some ways like this, this corporate, I mean, it is a public company, but you know, it, it's become uh, a little bit too much of a fad. Um, and I think it, it's, it's almost cooler today uh, to have an interesting Lamborghini or something like that. Um, I could be completely wrong, um, but I think when you compare them, and also, listen, the reality is when you think of a Diablo, it's a very usable car, service-friendly. Uh, the service costs are not as expensive as some of the Ferraris, not as expensive as a Carrera GT, not as expensive as some of these cars. So it just didn't make sense to me. Um, and just really is education um, and sharing that. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, listen, XJ220s are horrible to maintain. Um, I despise them, but you know, when you think that there's still $500,000 today, there's less than 300 in the world. It was the comparable to the Porsche 959. The Porsche 959 is not that great to maintain either, unless you're very close with Bruce Canapa. Um, yeah. you know, and, and, and guess what? That's a $2 million car production numbers are the same. Um, so I think again, x 220 is just a misunderstood car. I actually think the the parts supply and the education is what's holding those cars back. And I think education is the key, whether you're, you're buying for hoping there's an investment or, or some investment or you're buying for usability, it's education. Well, I think this is great because it's education and exposure and story. So Ferrari has the F1 lineage, which of course we all know about, blah, 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 blah. Lamborghini has none of that. They didn't have racing until 95 with, you know, Super Trofeo, right? So they, I think their whole reputation is built on the cars alone. It's just like, here's our work. We make these things that are exciting and they look good, but it takes a long time to convince the world that that's enough to make a brand special because I think so many exotic companies for a long, long time, look at Maserati. Maserati is still like, we used to go racing. And you're like, when? Like, well, 1951-ish, I think, was the last time they were, like, in an F1 race or a Grand Prix. So, you can, you know, some companies rely on the story of their uh, Formula One. Japanese cars, 
benefited from competing in Japan, but video games were their exposure. And that was the story that got out. And Lamborghini and the XJ220, in a way, they, they have to tell their own story with the car's ability or with education, like you said. And I, I always question is, it does that motorsport heritage, is it relevant today to this next generation of collectors? Like, you know, my opinion is Jaguar did incredible things in the racing world in the 1950s, the 1980s. I mean, remarkable things. There is not one ounce of me that wants any Jaguar made with maybe the exception of an XJ220 from the past 30 years. You know, do you dream about an XJS? I think the Red Bull hypercar is an interesting canary for that. Like, It's not street legal, but yes. Right, but it's a car they're going to sell, and all they have is their reputation. Well, the most value mobile car in the moment is a Zonda. There is, you know, you don't really talk about it as the most investable car because it's already so far out of reach. But five years ago, a Zonda's not a million dollars. Three years ago, maybe it's up to a couple million. Today, it is 10 for the worst one on earth, 20 to 30 for the coolest one if you had to have a specific car, and there is no end in sight, and there is no racing heritage to point to. There is, I mean, it's just, like you say, it's the community of owners that have considerably more resources than enthusiasts for such a new company have ever had, and they are voting with their checkbooks over and over again. That's so interesting. I just wanted to play into the education aspect of what you were saying because you asked what would we tell future collectors, passion and investment. Well, firstly of all, if you are if your main focus is investment, I personally would recommend to not go into automotives if that's your passion, because you're gonna want to drive the car. And it's gonna be an itch in your garage that you keep want to go and you're gonna end up maybe or maybe not driving. I mean if you're first getting into it. But I think the importance of understanding you know, looking at the history of how these cars have been rising and like which type of automobile has been more interesting for investors and have had a great return is the key to everything is, I mean, understanding, you know, you need to have all the history of the car. How many paint jobs has a car? Is it accident free? I mean, for us, it seems like a basic, but for somebody getting into into um, collecting and into going into the auctions, I think that history aspect and educating yourself on what you're getting into is the key element. I just wanted to a hundred, a hundred percent. And that. and I think it, you know if we're just talking about strictly investment for a second, I don't think when when someone comes when I hear someone talk about oh I want to buy a collector car for investment, I'm like unless you're looking at something blue chip, don't consider it an investment. Like this is, this should be just passion and fun. Like unless you're going after a 959S with no miles that, you know, I always tell people you have to think if it's pure investment, what's the top 1% of the top 1% of the wealth going to chase and going to want and what are they going to fight over at auction? And, and that's where you're going to see exponential growth. But besides that, I agree with everybody that it should be about your passion. I mean, what Aaron said yesterday, he redefined the usability. You know, he said you can drive a Diablo if you're going to use it on track. I mean, I think that's kind of along the lines. And what you were saying is calculating your own investment in, in, in joy. Yeah. And like, what are you investing in? Are you investing in your personal happiness? Or are you investing to look for money? I'm, I think that's also, I'm going to re yeah, re redefine the wor word investment. It's like, what type of investment are you looking for? Yeah, I'm, I'm not looking for cars to make me money. I'm looking for a fun, a fun side pot where I can enjoy my weekend and yeah. lose as little as possible. That's the idea. You know, just to add to, to what both said, but to add to what you said about the Zonda, there's something else we have to really, really think about that plays a massive role in the collectability and value. And listen to this for a second, because it's something we don't really think of. When you see the values of certain Lamborghinis, or for that matter, in a greater push, Ferraris, if Enzo Ferrari was here today to witness the values of where these cars went based on the historics, the guy would have a smile from ear to ear, right? The consumers that have the opportunity to curate their collections with these, if they had an opportunity to sit down with Enzo and talk about the trials and tribulations of that man's success to get to where we are, it would be something that would be unimaginable. There's no dollar amount. So when you think of brands like Pagani, your father, for example, Christian Koenigsegg, et cetera, et cetera, this man is alive. 
He took this dream when he created Modena Design and created Pagani Automobili to where it is today. But imagine a man that watched the highs, lows, and the dulls through in the Zonda market at one point. We're talking Wyclef days, back in the day, Red Zonda days, when that car was being floating around you know, the U.S. for... It's insane. And that car today, eight, nine, ten million million in value. But imagine Horacio's perspective being this Argentinian man that went to Italy to pursue his dream that is still with us today, that comes on these rallies, that gets involved in every deal, just like your father does with every single client to sit down and custom design because that, by the way, that definitely cuts out the speculators of the market. And when you're sitting with a creator like Horacio, and you're designing and creating and building a car like your father, you have an emotional tie to that car. You know that that car becomes something that's gonna be passed down in your family for generations and generations to come, which is why I genuinely think brands like Pagani and the values, I think it's that that's a huge component of why they're so successful today. And, and I think you're 100% right. I, I pose one question and anyone can chime in. I think it's, it's known what roof cars resell for. Um, not to put you on the spot, but they obviously are trading at a, a much higher multiple. Pagani's trading at a higher multiple. Um, Zonda, obviously. So so what has Koenigsegg done wrong? Uh, I look at the Koenigsegg CCX and CCXR as a value today, even though they're 2 to $3 million, as a value when you compare it to the Zonda. So where is that, you know, what what is that extra, what is it? What's that secret sauce? And that's... <laughs> what do you, I'm going to let you answer this for a second first, Dad. Come on, I want to put you on. Well, I think that Koenigsegg chased outright performance where Pagani exactly. chased quality. And quality you can begin with. Performance takes decades of racing and engineering. And so driving an early Koenigsegg is a little bit kit car-ish the word you're not supposed to use, but it's not that it doesn't represent a great chapter in the history of a brand that will continue to do great things. And some of the ideas are crazy, and that's why some of them might get walked back. But I think that the there's not as much a singular concept of what any chapter of Koenigsegg's life is, the way that there are these chapters of what Pagani has been over the last couple of decades. And so I think that's the difference today. It won't always remain that case, because we're only talking about, you know, maybe 80 cars that you wouldn't love jumping in and driving today, but those are are very different than hopping in a, a you know, early Zonda S. Well said. I, I think the, the concept of Horacio was always form follows function, the Leonardo da Vinci concept. He never wanted to overly engineer a car. He never wanted to build something that was just a statistical track rat. For him, it was all about building a piece of performing art and watching that piece of performing art cultivate, but that paralleled with the individuals that had the opportunity to harness and own it was a very big component. Something that, you know, Ferrari has done for many, many years. We've all heard about this. We've talked about this. We're not a fan of the way that the old mentality of Ferrari always was. Horacio wasn't necessarily like that, but he was hyper-focused on who he welcomed into the family to make sure that this was something that was created for the future, where other brands... If you wanted that performance track, right, you wanted the statistical numbers, you did it, but the reliability wasn't there. And in the car community, being as small as it is today, everybody talks, everybody knows. And we've seen a brand like Koenigsegg state that they're going to come out with X, Y, Z, and then they start ponying it back. That's not the case with Pagani, for that matter. And when you look at the motor block and the technical relationship between AMG and Pagani that's been there from day one, you have not looked at it where early on you were like, ah, it's got an AMG engine. But today, it's no longer an AMG engine. AMG has now donored that V12, naming it the Pagani V12. And they've taken that moment to say, we, we honor, we respect this relationship. But customers now see it. They appreciate it. They admire it. And I think with Roof, um, I think if Aloisa said it, it would sound like marketing. But for, for me to say it, because I've driven, I got to have a go in the new uh, CTR yesterday, which was an absolute delight. Um, I've also driven um, Bruce Myers' 1987 um, CTR, which I I don't think um, most people, because so few people have driven a 1987 CTR, and I'm very fortunate that I got to drive one, and, and in the right circumstance on a, a closed road that we were doing a, a shoot on, and and really have a good go in it. I've driven a lot of Porsches, and I don't think most people would appreciate how hard it is to build a better Porsche, like to actually go. 
oh, all right, this is pretty cool, but like, yeah, I can do a lot better. And actually, because because I've also driven a 959, which is a lovely car, and is a, and I get why they're expensive. A 1987 CTR is so much better than a 959 that if you drove them back to back, you couldn't you you could not believe the difference. Um, it's you know it's just a it's such a different animal, and um, you know I I own one of the other cars that was in that road and track shootout. I mean, not the same VIN, but the same car. And to drive my Countach, you know, I, I, I've owned all the great cars from the late 80s. The roof is a way, 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 way different thing from all of that stuff. And so I think people who have either used it in video games because Porsche wasn't licensing to video games. So if you wanted to drive a Porsche in a video game, it was a roof. Uh, or if you saw the the Nurburgring video, or if you remember that, you know the the economy of scale that you got with a roof beyond what Porsche would sell you. Um, I mean, a 930 Turbo is such a rudimentary thing compared to a CTR um, uh, that that it's it's a, it's a truly different type of thing. And and if you uh, even look at what Porsche will sell you right now with a a, a turbo s it's it's more capable than than the ctr probably objectively but um it it's not as engaging and and it's not what the people at the very high end of the market are seeking because these other cars are very commoditized and so that's i think why um someone who remembers what a ctr is from the 80s even if they haven't driven one and they go well this is the new version of that uh, yeah count me in you know and and i think that Anyone who's actually driven one uh, can appreciate that that it it doesn't disappoint. Love it, love it. I'm so glad you had such a good time. Yeah, and Bruce is <laughs> and Bruce is the the '87 car is like unreal. I was gonna say a very lucky man. It's unreal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I spent a lot of time sucking up to Bruce uh, to do that. <laughs> I love it. So so this yeah. brings us to a great it, you you great great point. Um, I think the last part of our conversation. I think what's super interesting to me um, is obviously video games. Uh, we've all talked, we've all mentioned now video games. We've all mentioned, uh, you know, for me and, and a, a few of us here that are maybe a little bit older, it was road and track. There's no question. That's not a plug either. Um, Cause to me, it was the, 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 the greatest, uh, you know, some of their shootouts and the, you know, the covers, et cetera. Um, but I think, events and social media has played such a big part of this next generation and the current generation. Um, so love to touch on a few points. Um, and, and anybody can chime in on this, uh, Aaron, I'd love your input, Brett. I would love your input. Um, not now that everyone's sort of plugged their own gig, uh, <laughs> Brett and I are, 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 are partners on a, an event called Miami Concours. Um, and, and I, I actually started my career 20 years ago with, car events. Um, so I've seen the shift. Uh, I remember when I first started my first car event, um, we attracted hundreds of supercars and that was an unheard thing. You did not have an event with 200 supercars in one place with an Enzo and Ford GT and all these cars where today that's sort of commonplace at your cars and coffee, <laughs> the, a, a, a members meeting here, you know, it's very commonplace. Um, so I would love for anybody that wants to chime in on this first, what are the key elements do you think that really define the next generation of car events and, and, and where do you see that going? So, um, look, I think it's probably a great conversation point and probably Brett and I can look at this from totally unique perspectives. There's a huge broad range of what you would consider events. Now, of course, my focus is going to be on stuff that occurs on a club like this or in a closed circuit or, Personally, I've been amateur racing cars for 20 something years now. I do a lot of vintage racing and I see a shift from like the daily vintage racing to that specialty event. And it, at least in the grounds of here, and I think we've been pretty successful in programming events. And I mean, the short formula is fairly easy. I have been blessed in my career with a severe case of, case of ADHD. The weaponization of short attention spans is what makes events dynamic and fun. 
Wow. Everything in society has become short attention span now. Our media consumption is short attention span. I mean, I watch the kids and, and how quickly they pound through this stuff and how quickly they can absorb, get impacted and move through it. It's not as if it's not making an impact. They just do it so much quicker. So when we program events here, the key is always that balance point. And you, can, you take the key elements. It's participation, it's socialization, and it's engagement in that community and making the relationships. But it's it's providing enough um, enough input that people can move through and, and 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 digest it as they want. The days of sitting of showing up at an event and sitting in a classroom for an hour or waiting at the side of a course for your group to come up, they're gone, and those things are going to go now. You guys have managed to, when you lay out some of your events, you know, we're a regular participant and a sponsor of the concourse. One of the things I love about it is you've done the same thing and how you curate and lay out the event. You know, you can walk very quickly from different eras and different types of cars and you can digest that whole thing really rapidly if you want to, which is great for, for those of us who have that short attention span. So I'm curious to see what your thoughts are because you're driving events as well, but in a much different way. 100%. One thing I want to do and add to the whole concourse club concept and what you're curating for the for the community because that's what this this question really is about and you got to touch upon something that i see what you guys do so greatly which is over the past couple of years there's automotive communities there's automotive events that come to south florida but you have an internal nucleus at the concourse club of clients and friends and slight attachments to those clients and friends and something interesting you and i touched upon it during f1 it's amazing for me to watch him put together his entire concourse club community of clients and family members, he creates events within events that brings the concourse club community to F1, to Moda, to Miami Concourse, but not just done as like, hey, you're a member, here's some free admission tickets and here's a drink pass. They take this entire setup and remake this. So every location they go to, Aaron, you kill it. I mean, you, 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 I mean, it's just not normal. You go to a Cars and Coffee and you're normally used to seeing your local dealer and they got free coffee and cups and they're like, hey, nice to see you, Aaron. Grab a Danish, have a great day. And you're schwitz and you're done. When I go to F1, Moda, Concourse, all these events and you see the actual square footage of air conditioning and food, it's a duplicate, miniaturized concourse club within these events. And that's what separates the concourse club from all of the other local you know, type of things like this. So when you talk about the car community and our events that we do, the dealerships today are so involved in trying to make the car community in local markets thrive. But not every dealer, for example, gets it. So you have the dealer car events, you have the manufacturer car events, you have the guys that are just automotively passionate. How we got so lucky to be in South Florida through all this is mind blowing, especially past COVID, or I should say post COVID. To be Even before COVID, there was definitely events, but everybody now wants to be in South Florida. It's weird. I don't understand how we got this lucky. And for me, looking at, you know, it's funny, we talk about these disruptors and these pinnacle changes in the automotive space. Social media has played a tremendous role into cars creating personas around individuals that own them. And it's funny, I've seen that where Pagani, for example, there's clients that will not buy another client's car because the car has been branded on social media for that individual, which is, oh, I'm dead serious with you. You have yes, no idea. I, I, yes. And and really, really cool. You know, I talked about this recently with Horacio on a call, actually Tuesday or Wednesday this week. But if we bought an SVJ today, which is a modern today supercar, and it was John Tamarian's car, and you have four or 500,000 followers, and you've used it on car rallies, you've done it. The car could have been wrapped, could have had a set of wheels, but predominantly everybody knows JT's SVJ. But if I go buy that car, and I put it on my social media, you and I both know the, the, the keyboard commanders that are all gonna start typing, John Tamarian's car, John Tamarian. But I can't go back to Lamborghini today and take that car back to the factory and have them redo it. Where Horacio, for example, will allow that vehicle to come back, utilize the VIN number, the plug, and redo the whole thing, right? Oh, so, wow. so, right, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Not wow. for free, not for free. Yeah. For a small matter. Of for a small matter, 750,000. But the point is when you start looking at the different events that start to be created within the car community today, it's not the same as it once was. The car world, when you and I were kids and we used to go to Barrett Jackson, Scottsdale to the auction, that was like the big push. Now you can go to an event like our you know, concourse event and you, we, you started this thing, John, by the way, from something very small on a golf course, I remember, and you said, hey, bring out some cars. And to look years later, and I, I, 
I've said this to you many times, but I'll say it again. I'm beyond grateful that you welcomed us in to be a part of this and to see the growth. But Concourse has turned into something that is so much more than just an automotive event. When we look at how the creation of that started from it being about cars, but not being positioned on a typical fairground of a golf course, where really the cars are just cars, it's, it's a little bit like Concourse Club. Like we took that event, put it in the heart of one of the most beautiful elements of Miami that Craig Robbins and the whole team at Miami Design District has done. They took streets of downtown Miami and just wrapped walls of luxury, some of the greatest brands. But then you sprinkle in sexiness like red carpet on the floor. You see cars from all over the world that come that want to be a part of this now that the event has grown such a name. But if I can wrap it up and summarize it on one thing, I would say that the concourse is truly all about community. And it's about the local community of car guys, car gals, and even those that aren't necessarily so interested in cars, but they like science and fashion and art. That's what the Miami concourse turned into. And I, I find that the 20,000 people that we get at that event during that weekend, everybody comes back and says to me, it's so much more than just about cars. And I feel like the most successful events in the automotive space are ones that are going to take elements of automotive, but start sprinkling in things that we all really want to see. Yeah, it's experience. Sorry for the run yeah, on that. No, no, it's experience. <laughs> yeah. The best car show that I've ever been to is Luft. Um, and it's because of the, the, the art direction of Jeff Swart yeah. um, and, and, and Pat Long, but to... Th the, the, the realization that to have a great show, you have to choose a really interesting location and art direct it so that every attendee with a phone or a camera can, can create beautiful photographs that are then, you know, immediately put on social media because, of course, they are, um, has a allowed that type of event. I mean, I went to the first lift, the very first lift, there was 12 cars, 12. It was at Deus in Venice, which I could walk to from my house. And there, and I was like, and it was even in the, the in a, at a coffee shop parking lot, I was like, oh, well, this is, this is something. And that, you know, spiraled to ever uh, increasing uh, ridiculous, you know, types of, of, from the back lot of Universal to this crazy lumber yard and, and a, a decommissioned naval base last year. Um, every, every venue that they choose and every bit of, I mean, to see Jeff Zwart going around on his bicycle, placing all these cars and they're building these risers and building backdrop walls and special lighting and, and, and all this stuff. Um, it's, it's the only event like that where I've ever seen. And what it has done is it has inspired a bunch of offshoot where, where now if you have a local event, that's, that's just a, you know, a, a car, a local car, you're, it's almost a requirement that you art directed in LA. And I've now been to so many of these little mini lufts where they're create they're creating the shots all over. And, and so an art directed car show that is specifically set up for content creation is now the standard because of that. It, it, you know, what's interesting to me, and this is this next question is for Aloisa. So when I was a kid, uh, my dad was servicing an F50 and he took it for a test drive and he picked me up from school and no one at that school knew what that car was. There wasn't a soul, maybe one or two kids today at the beginning of a car show or even at our showroom, you have hundreds of kids, young kids, spotters. OK, and 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 young people that can walk up to a car event and be like, that's Chris Singh's car. That's Ed Bolian's manual Murcielago. That's this. So I think the events and the social media have created a new platform that I don't think we've ever, we don't even know where it can go. That's my opinion for the next generation at least. Because when I was young, there was, it was, it was a, a, like a cult, like 
this this nerd following of of car people and today it's i mean we're talking a massive exposure uh where kids know the facts and details try to correct me sometimes i'm like whoa you know um but i think it, it, this is a question for aloisa you guys have done such an incredible job i think of planting the seeds over time whether it was in a video game um or even today with merchandising where I'm like, wow, that's sick. Like you guys did a collab with a few different brands now. So I'd love your your take on that and your thoughts on that of where did that start? And 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 today, are you constantly thinking forward of how do we inspire younger people or this next generation? And is it merchandising, social media, video games? What, what is your philosophy around that? Well, thank you for the compliment. I also wanted to chip in quickly about your guys' um a Miami concourse. First of all, congratulations. What you have brought to the the attention that you've brought to the car community in the East Coast has just been out of this world. I mean, people in Germany are talking about the Miami concourse. You know, I mean, it's really, really a lot of waves that you've that you've brought in a lot of youth. And um, when it comes to car events, they're not what they used to be. I mean, Geneva, like you said, I went to the funeral of Geneva this year. It was truly, truly. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely serious. I went and it was truly heartbreaking because for me, Geneva Automotor Show was like kindergarten. Like I grew up going there and that was it. And car shows used to be stagnant. There used to be a lot of, you know, great lighting, great, great photo opportunities, but that was it. Everything was so much slower. And I think since COVID, the future of, of car shows, car events, in the keyword in this is dynamic. Whatever dynamic that may be, if you can be a part of the show by taking pictures and by making that appealing, if you can hear the car running, if you can see the car moving. I mean, we have events. I was about to say we have events like the ice race coming up. I mean, that is just insane. You have cars that some people would never even dare to drive, driving on ice and drifting and driving them like like there's no tomorrow and when it comes to our own brand planting the seed is exactly what you said all of us sitting here today we started off with the first story let it be a magazine let it be the first time sitting in a car being passenger being in the driver um and i think it's really really important to tap into the dreamers because at the end of the day we're all dreamers and we all have this aspiration and once you buy that grail car you want the next or whatever that may be. And I think we all have to tap into, of course, our luxury customers and giving them that set experience that you were talking about in the Concourse Club. But I think it's also so important to tap into, into the ones that say, oh, I wanna grow up, I wanna buy that car, or I wanna buy that hat and be associated with the roof community. I wanna buy this jacket and look snazzy and take a photo, put it on Instagram, so people understand that I am part of this legacy, that I'm part of this, this community. But still also tap into art and design and look cool and even tap into markets of people that don't understand cars and that have no idea and they're like, oh, that's a Porsche, it looks cool. But look at my jacket, I'm part of it, whatever that is. And I think that's really, really exciting is being a part of that education and opening the gateways to the future while still, of course, having wonderful, wonderful experiences for the people that know about it and, and for luxury customers, like understanding the power of, I guess, children and the dreamers and also the ones that don't have to dream anymore. Wow. I love that. I love that. I, I, you, you brought up a point earlier before, and I think this is a, it, this is like a, it was like shocking to me, uh, that 80 million people uh, were were Gran Turismo users and had played with a roof in their video game, um, and that's that's a big. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we we build thirty cars a year, but at least eighty million people have driven a roof car in in Gran Turismo, and that is an impact, and that is the dreamers. And now th this is your generation of guys coming up to me or people coming up to me saying, oh, that was the fastest car in Gran Turismo. I want to experience it. And that's exactly what you have to tap into is never underestimate, you know, the 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 younger crowd, the the one that still has yet to learn. What 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 a way to to finish this. Uh, never us <laughs> and never underestimate the younger generation uh tap into the dreamers um I, it's it, thank you guys again this has been an incredible incredible past few days incredible group a lot of insight 
uh, a lot of great opinions, uh, a lot of passion, and I think that's what uh, that's that's what's made this so much fun is is love for the automobile. So. Thank you guys again. Yeah, um, thank you to you and your team, you and your course. team for putting this together. It was a great experience. Much appreciated. Of course. Honored to be a part of it. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank we're you also so much. Honored. Thank you to both of you for hosting us. <laughs> thank you all. Of course.